Right, thanks very, very much, uh, Sakina. So, as you say, let's take a look at what's happening in South Africa. We started speaking at the beginning of the program about the fact that does it ever slow down on the news front in South Africa? And the reality is no, because there's never a dull moment in South African politics. So, on Saturday, the National Prosecuting Authority decided to prosecute former Western Cape ANC chairperson Marius Fransman for alleged sexual assault. I mean, this follows uh, a 2016 allegation that were made by his former personal assistant, Louisa Venant, and uh, these referred to an alleged incident at a Kimberley hotel while Fransman and his entourage were on their way to the Northwest province for the ANC's January 8 event. Also, on Saturday, President Cyril Ramaphosa announced a 0% increase for salaries for certain parliamentarians. And we're going to look at that word certain. But uh, my guest to do all of this, political analyst Kaya Sitole, is in studio with us. Good to see you, Kaya. Likewise, likewise, Leanne. So Good you, morning. So you saying to us, guys, don't you ever go on holiday. No, we're not allowed to as long as South African news carries it's on the sad, way it does. It's sad, it's sad, But we all need a break as a country. We all need to go on therapy, actually. Do you think we're going to? That's my first question to you. Do you remember we have elections next year? Yeah. There are no holidays at this time. I, and the reality is that ahead of a general election, of course, the news cycle accelerates because yeah. there's so many things that are happening around there, political parties trying to position themselves, trying to sort of put themselves in, in, in a manner that the electorate can say, these are the people that we might be voting for next year. So it's going to be very busy for the next few months, actually. I think so. I don't think it's going to stop for one second. So let's begin to try and unpack it. I, I began by talking about Marius Fransman and the NPA deciding, you know what, we're going to go ahead and do yeah. uh, the work when it comes to this alleged uh, sexual assault case by some one of his assistants in 2016. She claims to have been sexually assaulted by him. Why now? Let's, let's, let's gather that first. There is obviously this enduring problem where we say that there is a big gap between, um, you know, transgressions being committed by particular political figures in, 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 in particular and accountability being made to be seen to be visible. And I think in this particular instance, of course, the first question we have to ask is if this case was brought to the fore in 2016, why did it take so long for the NPA to then say there's something for us to do about it? It could administratively be simply because they've been doing the work and trying to investigate over the past two and a half years. Nobody believes that. And yeah. the reality is that we know that the NPA has really become the epicenter of of what we refer to as a state paralysis, where essentially a lot of things that should be done do not get done if the affected or the implicated parties tend to be political figureheads. And perhaps when we talk about this idea of a new dawn that came into operation when President Jacob Zuma was ejected from office, maybe this is just one exhibit of them actually saying, well, actually, this is a new era. This is a new way of doing things. And for a person who has the stature in the ANC that Fransman enjoyed, for him to then behold into, in front of the justice system indicates to us that perhaps there is now a change where people will be held to account in spite of who they are politically or even administratively within the system. So it's a good sign, assuming, of course, that the NPA can successfully prosecute because yeah. we've seen incidences where there's a big press statement, we are going to do something. Just over a couple of years ago, Sean Abraham himself was sitting there saying that uh, Pravin Gordon has got something to answer. And then a couple of days later, he's like, well, actually, there's nothing to answer for. So, of course, we want to be able to see this being carried to fruition for him to then be held to account, whether in front of the courts or wh whichever platform is made available. But, of course, the history, recent history, indicates to us that this announcement doesn't necessarily translate into tangible outcomes. That's the reality. But mm. we have a new head coming in, mm. um, Shamila Batohi. I haven't asked you your opinions on her because, obviously, uh, she's coming in. Yeah. She's not there right now, but this is what we can expect from next year. What are your impressions of her? Were you sort of, uh, you know, your reaction? I'm gonna, Look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, I mean, words. as far as I looked at it, there were probably two candidates who really stood out for me during the interviews, and it was her being the outsider, as it were, and also Andrea Johnson. And I think what counted in her favor is that you get the impression that the NPA really needs someone who's going to come in with a fresh set of eyes and say, what are the issues? Is this a case worth prosecuting? Let us proceed with it. And of course, everybody who's been there in the NPA, particularly on the past 10 years when really a lot of issues were coming to the fore,
these are the people that were part of that architecture that either didn't do the right prosecutions or when they did do the right prosecutions, they couldn't get them successfully, um, you, you know, um, uh, uh, concluded. So I think that when you have someone who's coming from the outside to say, look, I'm bringing a fresh set of eyes, it will probably assist the NPA in sort of really moving itself forward. That being said, of course, what we really have to watch out for is that in the history of the NPA, no single leader has ever managed to complete that term. Mm -hmm. And of course, the politicians always have the veto power to be able to say that, no, no, you're getting too close to us. So therefore, we are going to eject you. So we're hoping that it doesn't happen with her. And she being appointed in the age of Suru Maposa gives us the impression that perhaps this is a person who's not going to be subjected to what Vusi Picoli was subjected to, the Menzis Melane issue and even the Masane issue. I mean, the NPA has been a whole epicenter of drama over the past 10 to 15 years. And it started with Tabum Begi actually deciding that he wanted to get rid of Vusi Bikoli because of how close he got to the Jackie Celebi issues. So, of course, it's got a very bad history. And we're just hoping that for once, this is going to be someone who's going to get a 10-year contract and will be there until her last day in 2029. That is yet to be seen. Like you say, no one's ever managed to achieve that. So we'll hope that this will probably be a, a first for South Africa and the, the NPA head. So I'm not sure, but let's hope for the best on that one. Um, let's take a look at sort of uh, the ANC, again, uh, focusing in on, on Marius Fransman, because he, he obviously has to stand trial. Now, the reality is we still don't know which province he's going to be standing trial in because he faces one count of sexual assault and one of crim, uh, criminal injuria. Does the fact that these are two different charges going to delay this trial and also the suspension of his ANC membership is still there? That was his, uh, his suspended five-year membership as well. Look, I think one of the issues that people tend to say about the South African justice system in particular is that it appears to be very lethargic to the outsider. Now, of course, his legal team will legitimately then try to delay it as much as, we, as they can. We've seen a perfect example of that with former President Jacob Zuma, where essentially you can find avenues and loopholes in the justice system to really delay the accountability issue. Now, of course, in this particular instance, what you're seeing here is that he obviously has got charges to answer for. And if he was the type of person who believed that he he was, um, uh, he was innocent of all charges, he would say, let us accelerate the process. But of course, we know that politicians are not in the habit of accelerating the process of accountability. So I do think that even the fact that, you know, there was the West, the, there was the Northwest issue is where he was headed. And then Kimberley is where he was based when the alleged transgression comes in. You really do ca call into question the question, the issue of where exactly should he be prosecuted. But that being said, I think once we deal with the administrative issues of even trying to identify which is the legitimate structure, in which you should be hold, hold into account once the matter gets to court I think that we really will be able to then try and see the dimensions that really exist between political figureheads and essentially the people that work for them because we do know that in particular in, in, in South Africa we've got this particular problem where men in positions of authority really tend to abuse their positions and in particular the victims tend to be the women that yeah. work for them and I think for us this would be a good indicator of how we can hold these people to account and of course him being a political figure means that you bring the political and the social dimensions where South Africans will, able, will be able to then engage in the conversation. Unfortunately, when you say the ANC, remember it was the same party that had its former president being held in front of the courts in relation to an alleged rape incident in which he was acquitted. But of course, even during that particular process, you saw that the party itself sort of aligned itself towards him rather than towards the victim in, in, in a situation where the country really should be prioritizing the victims even before the cases are brought to trial because we know that in reality most overwhelmingly most of the incidents turn out to be saying that the victim was indeed violated there are these few exceptions where the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator does get acquitted and this was the case in the Jacob Zuma incident but the ANC didn't come out shining because they were seen to have sided with the perpetrator or well, the alleged perpetrator even before the matter was okay. holding to the courts and of course when you have a situation where a lot of women are saying that actually we've got these particular problems can they then trust the ANC to champion their cause and that unfortunately doesn't seem to be what the public will, will thinks of the we, ANC. We, we even saw, I mean, just getting back to your case, the ANC Women's League taking that stance as well. So, I mean, that was not <clears throat> a, a good moment for the women of South Africa at all. Yeah, and yeah. we could talk about this the entire interview, but we need to move on. And I want to talk a little bit about what we're asking our viewers and also the story that came out over the weekend that uh, a number of MPs, such as the National Assembly Speaker, I think it's Premier's, 
uh, certain MECs, ministers, deputy ministers, they're not going to be getting an increase at all. However, certain um, parliamentarians are going to get an increase. So it's a bit of a mixed bag there. So wh what do you make of this news? Look, I think it is a very good thing for the president to have done to say, actually, we have to call it, we have to really talk about austerity and if you talk about austerity we can't just be telling the rest of the South Africans that they need to sort of tighten up their belts. We also need to be seen to be championing that cause. So for me he's done the right thing in saying that actually these people do not deserve a particular increase. And also quite importantly here is that these people are not exactly poor. So if you look at their exactly. salary scales, you know, these are the type of people that we're like, okay, fine, I'm not getting an increase this year, yeah. so perhaps I'll buy one less item from Woody's. Yeah, it's okay. So I they're mean, not going to be that. suffering. But I think, of course, for him, it sends the right message that he is being responsive to the call out there that says, guys, we as a collective, we as a country are struggling out there. So it would have looked very bad for him to then say, oh, the people that are already earning over 2 million rand a year, for example, yeah. should deserve an increase because that, that comes from the public purse. You kind of take like an instance of the, the, the Speaker of the National mm. Assembly, Bilek and I mean, 2.7 million rand is what she earns annually, and she's not getting an increase. But I mean, I, I find it hard within my heart to feel sorry for her. <laughs> Or Look, anyone else, actually. And I think one of the key issues when we talk about parliamentarians and politicians is that people tend to focus on just the actual cash that gets transferred to them. But these people essentially get additional benefits. Exactly. The fact that you can have a house in Cape Houses, Town, cars, a house in Pretoria, cars and all of that, it means that literally what they get as benefits from the fis fiscus is much greater than the salaries that we see for them. Yeah. So for me, in instances where we're saying that they're not getting an increase, they're not getting an actual cash increase, but of course, their benefits remain in place. So it's not like suddenly they're going to have to downgrade in one particular issue because they don't even own the houses that they stay exactly. in. So for the rest of us, when somebody yeah. says that you're not getting an increase, you then have to really look at your budget for them. For, but for them, it's simply a matter of, well, you know, we carry on doing the things the way that we're doing them. So it's a good sign for the president to then say, actually, we should give the right message to the public at large. And remember, this is a president who already donates half his salary himself, yeah. as it were. So I do think that on that front, he's got the right message to society where somebody will be able to say, well, actually, the president seems to understand our plight. And this is why he has said that 0% increase. But of course, people that are lower down in the rung of even that political ladder are themselves getting increases because you get the impression that the president's of the opinion that they deserve an increase. Whether you and I believe that people who already earn a million rand even deserve the 2.5% is a I question for another day. Kings and queens get 2.5% mm. increase. Senior traditional leaders will receive a 4% increase. Uh, magistrates are going to get a 4%, um, but constitutional court judges will get a 2.5%. So it's not across the board, and there is still a lot of money that's going to them. So, yeah, yeah. yeah we'll but leave it... But more importantly, it's all below inflation. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, I want to, we, we're running into the news that's going to be starting in a couple of minutes, but what I need to do is your take on the, on the National Assembly passing the motion uh, to uh, establish that uh, ad hoc committee yeah. that's now going to draft the amendment to the Section hmm. 25 of the Constitution, expropriation <laughs> of land without compensation. Give me your views very quickly. Look, there. I've been one of the people that has been saying for a long time that even if you amended the constitution overnight, all you will do is give the politicians an additional instrument of intervention. Whether they'll ever use that instrument of intervention and actually make things happen, for me, remains this, the elusive question. And over this past weekend, we actually had the land colloquium. So what has happened is that the president appointed this panel of 10 experts who are supposed to advise him on land reform broadly. And of course, the question of expropriation without compensation is a subset of that uh, land reform question. So for two days on um, uh, Friday, and Saturday we were sitting with this land reform panel and they were asking for advice on really how to move the process forward. And of course when you're sitting there and then you're hearing what the work that they've done already and what they still need to do before they present a report to the president in March 2019, you get the idea that finally there is some political consensus in saying that actually something needs to be done. Now, of course, what will happen is that they will provide a, a report to the president. Parliament itself might amend the constitution. We still don't know yet. They might just read the constitution now and say, actually, nothing needs to be changed. But after all that is said and done, we still don't know whether we've got the right political principles to then say, we've done all this work. This is how we accelerate land reform in the country. And until you find a way of actually making these things tangible and implementable, it's really just a political conversation. It's a political game that was started by the EFF going to Parliament and saying there's something wrong with the Constitution, while some of us kept saying to them there's nothing wrong with the Constitution, there's it's everything the wrong with the it. political principles who are supposed to be implementing the Constitution. Yeah. Then you get the IFP saying, as we lead into news, um, they say he, the leader saying that 
Uh, land redress will open old wounds and destroy social cohesion in the country. Yes or no? Well, that's his view. And this is obviously a person who doesn't believe that uh, running a political party since 1975 is a problem itself. Because, you know, you get the impression that if he's going to give advice to society at large about how things ought to be done, he needs to start in-house and saying, well, actually, it makes no sense for me to be the political principal of a party since 1975. I need to be able to allow new ideas to be infused into the party. Now, of course, when he then says that there's this threat to social cohesion, we then have to ask him, well, do you think that the current status quo is actually ideal? And of course, the answer is that it's absolutely not. So what he should be giving as advice is to say, this is how you can manage the process without disrupting social cohesion, instead of just saying, oh, there's going to be a threat to social cohesion without him offering an alternative to say, this is how we can avoid it. Kaya Sitole, always a pleasure listening to your views and picking your brain on some of the, the big stories that came out of the political landscape last week. And of course, we're in for another big political week this week. So let's find out what's topping our news bulletins at 7 o'clock. Sakina, good morning to you.